Hi, ladies. Can you believe that it's our last day together for this semester? I want to be like, yay, but also kind of sad because I'll miss you. Um, but I hope that this semester has just been a blessing to your heart and that you have experienced the transformation that God's word and his spirit have the power to produce in our lives. I'd like to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 to 58. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So I'd encourage you to continue being steadfast in the Lord. Let's gather our voices, our hearts together. Let's praise our Lord Jesus. Lost its grip on me. You have. 
hope, our living hope. You didn't just die and stay there. You rose again and you intercede at the throne for us. And not only that, we're seated in the heavenlies with you and you give us power over the enemy. We don't need to be bound by sin and shame any longer. You have set us free. Oh Lord, help us to stand firmly in that freedom, to stand firmly in who we are in Christ, in the power that you have bestowed upon us. You are the one in whom we put all of our hope and you're the living God, so it's a living hope. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Welcome again to Study and Share Women's Bible Study of Calvary Church in Lancaster, PA. My name is Peggy Huber. I'm Director of Women's Ministries at Calvary, which I've been doing for 21 years. And this is my last teaching session before I end my career here at Calvary. Um, I technically retiring, but I just don't like that word, so here we go. Um, I've been teaching before I was director of women's ministry, so I figured, I just figured out, I think I've been teaching at Study and Share for 27, 26 years, something like that. And this is my final time, so I am so glad to have this opportunity to be with you as we talk about our union with Christ. And this is the third of three lessons we started this semester looking at the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're going to refer back to some things we learned then in this lesson. Um, but before I go any further, I have some things I want to tell you. I promised you last week I'd give you a sneak preview of spring semester. So here we go. Um, coming next semester, what we're going to be studying is everyday theology. The subtitle is what you believe matters, and it does. It, it, it so much does. And I can hear some of you saying, oh, I'm not a theologian. Yeah, I think I'll sit that one out. You know, I have news for you. As soon as you have a thought about God, you are now a theologian. So the question isn't, am I a theologian or not? The question is, am I a good theologian? So our teaching team has been working on this since summer. We are all very excited about what we're learning and what we want to share with you on eight key topics of theology. <clears throat> we're going to make it very user-friendly, and the book itself is very user-friendly. So here's what you're going to need to know for next semester. Everyone will need to re-register. What we're going to do is we're going to wipe out all of our fall semester groups, and you're going to need to re-register. Here's why. I'm pretty sure that you might want to make a different decision about how you're going to participate during January coronavirus season than you did in September. So it's just going to be simpler to have everybody re-register again, okay? And we're also looking for an uh, to identify a contact person in each group, no matter how your group is meeting, just so that we can care well for your group, so we can communicate with your group. If you sign up that you're willing to be a co uh, the contact person, that doesn't mean any other responsibilities other than you're the one we'll email if there's information you need to know. Um, frankly, I didn't think we would end fall semester the way we began it. I thought our groups would almost have to dissolve and we'd go straight online. And so I mean, it was a pleasant surprise that we're able to end today exactly the way we started in September. Thank you, Lord. So one other thing you're going to want to know is the cost for the book is $13.99. They just raised the price by $2, but they're going to honor the price that they quoted us. So we're about to place an order for that. It would be so helpful um, if we knew how many to order. So I would ask you to register soon. Not yet, though. We're not ready. Give us till the end of next week. I'm hoping by the end of next week, registration will be up on the Calvary Church website, which is calvarychurch.org slash women. Okay? And we'll figure out how we're going to get books distributed and that sort of thing. So there we go. Um, so the other thing that I know that you're dying to know as I leave, who's going to be the new director of women's ministry at Calvary Church? I have to tell you, I was more concerned about this, honestly, than the election. But God has shown his hand 
of might and worked quickly to bring us Liz Rodriguez. Liz is a native of Dallas, but recently coming to us from serving at a church in Oklahoma. She has arrived in town. Her first work day is this Sunday, as I'm speaking, while you're list when you're listening, it will be the Sunday that was just passed, December 6th. So you can be looking for her around Calvary Church and greet her warmly. I absolutely love her already. I am so excited for how she's going to lead, study, and share. Her heart and passion are similar to the ones that we've been building on for years. So that's what's coming next semester and next week. I am going to introduce Liz to you on a video um, that we'll record next week. So you can just tune in again at the time that you usually tune in and just learn a little bit more about Liz before spring semester starts. And I'm going to have another special guest join us as well. Okay, so let's move back to our union with Christ. What we've seen each week is that it's centered around this little preposition, with. We are in Christ. We have had things done for us by Christ. We have possessions through Christ. But this, there are six events, actually, that talk about us being with Christ. And they're listed here. The crucifixion and resurrection, the ascension and Pentecost, his coming, and his revelation. And we've spent the first two weeks looking at uh, the first four. And it was through a very painful season of my life that God cemented these truths into my heart and totally changed the way that I live my Christian life. So I'm just going to fly over that, and these are the things that I know for sure because God taught me over a period of about two years. So I apologize. I'm trying to cover it for you in three sessions. Um, I'm happy to talk with you about it, and it doesn't matter that you don't comprehend it all. I still don't comprehend it all, but I embrace it. So I hope you do too. So, and we've seen in his crucifixion from Romans 6 that our old self was crucified with him. It was payment made. A ransom was paid for us, for our freedom from sin. So because the old self was crucified with him, we can therefore put off the old self. There I am. There you are, crucified with him. Then Jesus was raised from the dead at the resurrection. And we find out, again from Romans 6, that we were raised to newness of life with him. Therefore, we have freedom from the sin that used to enslave us. So we can put on the new self. Then we see in the ascension that Christ is seated in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and powers and names that were, have been named, not just in this age, but in the age to come. That's Ephesians 1. God seated him in the heavenly places. And in Ephesians 2, we find out that we were seated in the heavenly places with him. So that gives us a victory over the enemy of our souls. So we can follow God's call to submit to God and resist the devil. And the scriptures tell us if we do that, he will flee from us. Yes. Um, and then Pentecost, Jesus said an amazing thing to his disciples. He said, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the, Holy, the helper won't come. But if I go away, I'll send him to you. It's mind-boggling to think that there could be anything better than living on earth in the earthly presence of Jesus. But Jesus said, yes, there is something better. I'm going to send a helper. And we discover that helper is the Holy Spirit. I have no idea how to draw the Holy Spirit in this little diagram. So I just found this symbol of flames. So he sent the Spirit to be in us forever. The Holy Spirit had been with the disciples had been with believers in the Old Testament, but knew Jesus was sending him to be in us forever. So we can follow God's call to be filled, to be empowered, to be controlled by his Holy Spirit. So that's a way quick flyover. So we see the whole thing on this slide, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and Pentecost. So what's the so what of that? 
I forgot to tell you in our video last week that I know I skipped page five of your worksheets. I did that on purpose because I felt like I had already given you way more than enough to digest in our lesson last time. So I'm going to start here, having now gone through those four events, the, the things that God showed me that are mine because of the crucifixion, the resurrection, ascension, and Pentecost. So let's turn to page five of your worksheets. We're going to read through the scriptures and see the answers jump right out at us. <clears throat> so first of all, we're going to go to 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power has granted to us, it's a gift. So you can say, God's divine power has gifted to us, what? Everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So what you can do is write up in that blank everything pertaining to life and godliness. Union with Christ provides me and you, if you're a Christ follower, everything pertaining to life and godliness. Notice that very key word, everything. He has gifted us everything we need for life and godliness. When God shone the light on that verse in my life, I thought, oh my, I have been living in such a <clears throat> spiritual poverty way when God has given me everything I need for life and godliness. And we see that some of that everything is contained in those four events we just looked at, the crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and Pentecost. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 1.30 um, and see what else is ours because of our union with Christ. It says there, see the context in verses 26 through 31. I'm hoping when you spent time at home that you actually looked there, but I'm going to read it for you because it helps us understand verse 30 a whole lot more clearly. Uh, this is a very humbling passage. For consider your calling, brethren, sisters, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that no man or woman may boast before God. But, here we come to our verse, by God's doing, so again, a gift from God, by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us four things, wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So there's four things listed there, but the word that jumped out at me when God was tutoring me through the season of my life is the word sanctification. As I've told you in the previous two lessons, I was on a performance treadmill trying to earn my own sanctification by doing all the right things that Christians should do. And here it's telling me that it's a gift from God that Christ is not just my salvation, but my sanctification as well. Grab onto that thought and ask him to show you more deeply all that that involves for you. Okay, we're going to move on on... Um, Page five, union with Christ now also provides me two other things. And again, this is, it said, see the context of verses seven through 10. We're going to look at verse nine, but I'm going to read that through you, for you. So the apostle Paul has just finished describing some experiences he had, some supernatural revelations that God had given him and the results from that. Verse seven. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And now verse 9. And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is is made perfect 
in weakness. So again, we see another gift. The word grace is something that we get by grace is by definition something we cannot earn. It is a gift. So God says, my grace is sufficient for you in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will boast about my weaknesses, says Paul, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So we want to put up here that union with Christ provides me with grace that is all sufficient for every need I will ever have in my spiritual journey. Terrific. Okay, and moving on to Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. The Sabbath originally for Israel was a gift from God, a time to rest. And a sign for them, actually, if you look at the Old Testament, that they could rest from their works. So there remains, therefore, even now, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered his rest has him, whoops, <laughs> Whoops, what am I doing here? God's rest has himself also rested from his or her works, as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. It, it's almost like an oxymoron. I want you to rest, but I want you to be diligent about entering that rest. So we have a responsibility. We have um, something to do to make sure we're walking in his rest, not that in our efforts. I love that phrase. So that's looking at the things on page five, the four things, and there are more, but those four things are the things that the Lord really pressed into my heart that are mine because of my union with Christ. So now let's move on to this week's lesson about his coming and revelation. And so I've told you in the previous lessons that a lot of this learning started because I was wrestling with scriptures that I didn't understand. There was lots of agonizing. There was lots of drama. There was lots of emotion. There was lots of pain. So um, I'm here to tell you that I have new questions, but I'm not, it's not, not all the drama with it. It's a verse that I noticed eh, maybe sometime in the last year. That just has me wondering. So what I'm going to share with you now are just ponderings. It's a work in progress. I invite you to join me in the research, in the search, in the understanding. Feel free to tell me, send me a note that says, hey, here's what I know about that, as I'm in the learning process on this. So um, it goes back to hmm, the famous location where my spiritual rampage began. You can listen about that two lessons ago if you want to go back to lesson nine. So it's Colossians three, which is that I was begging God for an answer to the dilemma in my life. And this is the passage he sent me to. Colossians three, one through three says, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, and we have, then keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I hope by now you're seeing some of the beauty that is embedded in that simple little sentence. But that's the sentence that drove me crazy at the beginning. So crazy, in fact, that I stopped reading right there. But here's the verse I noticed several months ago, verse four. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, oh, that sounds like another event. Future, not past, but another event. So when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. There's our little preposition, with. Okay, so what's that mean then? What are the implications of that? That's where I've been um, pondering these past several months. So. I've split this into two future events, actually, his coming and his revelation. I don't believe they're the same event, so I'm just going to breeze over his coming because we actually looked at that <coughs> when we studied First Thessalonians in Lesson 7. And this is our first passage. <coughs> So we do not, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, 
We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. This isn't, doesn't mean people who are taking a nap. We discovered that that means believers who have died. Uh, it's a metaphorical term for the death of a believer. It's just sleep for now because something's going to come. So we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, <coughs> about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. And I've marked that word hope because we're going to see it in passages yet to come. And I just use an, I always use an anchor because there's a verse in Hebrews that says we have this hope as an anchor of our soul. That's just what I do. For if we, okay, so he says, we're, I don't want you to grieve like people who have no hope about believers who have died. And he's going to paint for them a picture of hope. And here's the chronology of events. Down in verse 16, the first thing that's going to happen is the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. What's going to happen next? Up in verse 14, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. In other words, believers who have died, whose soul, spirit, immaterial part is currently in heaven. They're going to descend with Jesus from heaven at that time. The, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That means that their bodies that were buried of those believers are going to rise from the grave. Then, in verse 17, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. So that's a real quick flyover of that passage. If you want to dig in depth, go back to the video for lesson seven and there'll be a um, more fleshed out explanation. But what's the conclusion? Therefore, comfort one another with these words, because in fact, there is hope. Okay, also in his coming, this is on page six, I forgot to tell you that, uh, that the Thessalonians verse is on page six, so are these. So what else, what's this thing, what's this event going to look like? How else can we flesh out a few more details? So Paul is now writing to the Philippians and he says, our citizenship is in heaven, from it, which we eagerly wait for a savior. I've marked that because we're going to see that phrase again. So we are eagerly waiting for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will do what? He will transform the body of our humble estate into conformity with the body of his glory. What's that going to look like? I don't know, but it's going to be wonderful. By the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. Let's read on in 1 Corinthians 15. It's now going to describe a little bit more about that body transformation. This is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, but it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power, and it is sown a natural body, and it is raised a spiritual body. I don't know how that all happens, but it's, it's going to happen very quickly. But it is going to happen. That's the point of the, the matter. So then let's turn over to verse to page 7 and let's look at the so what of that, about his coming. So what about his coming? Um, his coming means hope. Because remember, Paul started in Thessalonians. I'm going to tell you some things so that you can grieve, but not like people who have no hope. So he's providing us hope because Christ is coming. Therefore, I can obey God's call to be steadfast in hope. Stand firm. Look for that word in a, in a bit. So 1 Corinthians 15, 51 50 through 58. Paul is writing again, and he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. That means something that we didn't know of before. We will not all sleep, in other words, believers, we will not all die, but we will all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable and will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. Then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, 
where is your sting? Continues. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives, here's another gift, gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what? Therefore, my beloved brethren and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is a portrait of hope that can get us through the mundane, dreary stuff, the crises, the sadness, the grief, the struggles. We have hope because he's coming and everything is going to change. So now let's go, uh, no, still on page seven. There was this verse, and so when I first wrote the worksheets, I thought, I think that goes with his coming. But the more I read it, I thought, mm, maybe it goes with his revelation. So honestly, I'm not sure yet. So that's why I separated it out for this presentation. But let's read it. It's got great news in it. Beloved, this is now the uh, Apostle John writing a letter. Beloved, we are now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. So he's thinking ahead to a future event. But here's what we do know. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. So is that him appearing in the clouds where we will meet him in the air? Or is it his appearing when he comes and back to earth the second time at his revelation. I don't know. But regardless of when it is, when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope set on him purifies himself, herself, just as he is pure. So we want to live in light of these future events in living pure lives, obedient lives, God-honoring lives, those sorts of things. It gives us motivation for when we get up every day. So now um, it's going to go back to verse to page 6, and we're going to look at the verses that are very clear that it's about his Christ's revelation. So it says, this is Paul writing again in both of these verses. This is Paul, the Apostle Paul. He says, oh, look, you are eagerly awaiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ who will confirm you to the end, blameless, on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know that's going to be a supernatural thing, that I would end up blameless. There's only one way that's going to happen. The mighty hand of God. We know that he's conforming us to the image of his son. And when that is complete is when we'll be face to face with him. Paul continues writing in Colossians 3, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, again, that's another event then, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. It's the verse where I started. So I'm still pondering all of this. You will be revealed with him in glory. I don't know. What's that about? I don't know. But here's some things that we do know from looking at the verses about these two future events, his coming and his revelation. Here's some words that have shown up in all of these verses. Comfort, transformed, imperishable, immortality, power, victory, hope, blameless, grace, glory. So what's the so what of that? Well, his revelation to me, this is my you know, current guess anyway, if I were to sum it up in one word, it would be glory. Therefore, I can obey God's call to eagerly wait in diligent readiness. You've already seen the eagerly wait show up twice. Let me show you where I got the phrase diligent readiness. 1 Peter 1.13 this is Peter writing in both of these verses. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and keeping sober in spirit, set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Set your hope completely, not on anything on this earth, but on the fact that Jesus is coming 
and he's coming for us and he's prepared a place for us. I didn't even include that verse. That we can be with him forever. Let's keep reading in 2 Peter chapter 3. According to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. So that's where I got the diligent idea, and we need to be ready. I, people, when, when people start talking about these future events, they can tend to get bogged down in the details, including the timeline. When is this going to happen? And people have made guesses for hundreds of years, and, oh, this is going to be the day. And the scriptures are very clear that it's not ours to know. It's not ours to even be wait, spending a lot of time on that. The point of every passage that talks about future events is be ready, be ready, be ready. So because he's coming and because his revelation is coming, I am to eagerly wait in diligent readiness. And so are you. By the way, you might have noticed how I've formatted the the slides this week. It only took me 11 lessons to remember that Emily is down there in the left-hand corner doing signing for us each week. So I moved the text so you could see the text. Sorry that it took me 11 weeks to have that light bulb dawn. But anyway, hi, Emily. Thank you so much for the richness you're adding to these lessons by your faithful service. All right, so we've now covered... Crucifixion, Resurrection, Ascension, Pentecost, and some ponderings, not conclusions yet, about his coming and his glory. How are you going to keep all this in your head? How do we begin to let this impact our everyday life? Well, a tool that I was exposed to in the crisis time when when God was putting these pieces together for me is called the Daily Affirmation of Faith. It's a prayer. Um, it's it's a long one, and, but it, it is so packed with truth. Sometimes I pray the whole prayer. It's got a page two also. Sometimes I pick portions out of it, but I'm going to post this on the website. It'll be there when you're watch, by the time you're watching. I share it with you. It's another tool to put in your tool talk, toolbox. I grew up in a church where we um, had a lot of prayers that we recited over and over again. And so in a certain sense, I think... Uh, I'm a little hesitant to do this, but this is so rich that I I consider it, I was actually reading a book called Union with Christ, which I would highly recommend to you. It's current. Um, it's in our church library, actually, at Calvary. Now I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, yes. Anyway, in that book about the union with Christ, it says, basically, we need a daily tutorial to remind ourselves of the truth of the scriptures that are ours in regards to our union with Christ. So that's how I look at this prayer. It's a daily tutorial to get my my distracted mind back on focus, back on track. If it will help you to do that, feel free to use it. All right, so now we've come to the place, what did I learn? How did it, was God leading me to respond? And what have you learned? And how's God leading you to respond? Well, one of the things I'm hoping that you've learned is the richness that is packed in that little four-letter word, with. We have only begun to scratch the surface. I expect that God's going to be teaching me more about who we are with Christ till I take my last breath. But I have to come back to Colossians 3, where the drama and the struggle all began. This passage that drove me crazy at the, fir- at the beginning has become so beautiful to me. Maybe I should put it on my tombstone. Hmm. Except I don't think I'm going to have a tombstone. But anyway, Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. For you and I, as Christ followers, have died, and our life is hidden with Christ 
in God. So there's one other thing I want to share with you. It's another verse that I just was reviewing um, things in a book called New Morning Mercies. If I could get each of one of you a Christmas gift as my parting gift from Calvary Church, it would be this book. It will carry you through the rest of all of 2021. It's a devotional book. There's a reading for each day of the year. And it is rich, 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 um, profound writings, um, not just fluff. So I'm going to read you one that I just was looking over again recently. And it talks about this word with. Oops. So the author writes, remember that you have not been sent out into this world on your own. You have not been asked to do the impossible in your own strength. You have not been asked to journey through this dark world all by yourself. As Jesus was sending his disciples out into this dark world to bring the message of the gospel, he said something that really changes everything. He said, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus didn't send us out with a pack of principles and promises. He doesn't just guide our travels with a set of rules. No, he does so much more. He comes with us. He knows that we'll never make it unless he is with us in every moment of every situation, location, and relationship. He is not a rescue squad that leaps into action in our moment of trouble. He's there with us in the trouble because he's been there with us all along. In our journey, he gives us the only gift that will help us. He gives us himself. In him, we really do find everything we need until our journey has ended. Behold, he said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Oh, Peggy. So for your silent reflection. Oh my goodness. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to keep my distance. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. But we wanted to say we love you. And <laughs> we're. Am I supposed to pay attention to that <laughs> voice? <laughs> Fortunately, it wasn't male. I thought, it's God? Oh, my word. Oh, my word. Look at you all. Aww. We wanted to come and just give our love and our blessing on your next steps. Um, we have loved teaching with you and serving with you. And so we have a little gift. Oh, it's gorgeous. And we oh, wanted to share it with all of the study and share mm -hmm. ladies. And you so can't see, but there's some of my other teaching. <gasps> it's Liz, too. <laughs> and Liz is here. <laughs> you so. are sneaky. <laughs> so surprised. <laughs> I'm surprised. And there's my buddy, Will. My buddy, Will. Yeah. Hi, Will. Yeah. Um, thank so you. I'm going to pray okay, a thanks. blessing on you, but mm -hmm. I'll keep my distance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dear Lord, uh, we love you, and we just praise you for the gifts that you give. Thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you for the gift of your word that we can open and study. And thank you so much for the gift of Peggy and her life and her ministry Thank you for her obedience to you, and thank you for just all the lives that she's touched over the years, and Lord, we know that you who, when you begin a good work, you, mm -hmm. you'll complete it, and Lord, you've only completed a portion now of Peggy's rich life and rich ministry, and we dedicate the rest of her life and her ministry to you. Um, I know that you have good things in store um, for her. Thank you so much for her desire to finish strong and to always serve you faithfully. And I just pray, Lord, that um, she will continue to have a heart that is humble before you and that is just open to doing your will. And thank you, Lord, for her example. Thank you that we can be imitators of her and her 
her faithfulness to you, Lord. And I thank you for these last few weeks that she's been able to just open up her heart as she's taught your word and she's shared with us, Lord. Thank you so much just for all that you've done in her life. And thank you for all the work that you will continue to do. And um, thank you so much for the blessing that she has been to all of us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a sneaky surprise. <laughs> we love you. And this is. Um, I'm going to let you yes, put, it put it down because I'm afraid no, like, I'll start juggling stuff and then it'll be crash. So thank you for your partnership in ministry, all of you. I literally could not have done this without you. If I, I, I was wanting to have like a parade of people, all the people that it has taken to make this semester work, and, but the stage would be full and we'd spread too many germs. So I won't do that. But <laughs> here's just some of my partners in ministry. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And now we can let you finish. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, I was at Silent Reflection. <laughs> okay. I'm going to do it differently. I'm not going to pose a question to you. We're going to listen to a song that really struck me. Um, it was the closing song at a worship service at Calvary Church on November 8th. So we're going to, I'm going to have you do your silent reflection during that song. And the, word, the name of the song is, Yet Not I, But Christ, Through Christ in Me, which is what all this has been about. So before we do that, though, I want to show you group discussion and prayer suggestions. You notice I put discussion and prayer together. I'm not sure how you want to do this, but I would suggest that you talk and pray and talk and pray and talk and pray. So what is one area of your everyday life where you want to see God bring about the reality of the words, yet not I, but through Christ in me? And then pray for each other as you share those things to begin to live daily in the riches, the treasures that are ours because we are united with Christ in the crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, Pentecost, his coming, and revelation. Uh, let me just look at my notes because I'm off track. Yeah, so I'm going to close in prayer for you. Uh, ending, it was funny, right? I, I probably shouldn't say this, but anyway, one of the tech guys who's helping me, I had figured out that I'd been teaching at Study and Share for 27 or 28 years. Um, and I said, so, Jason, how old are you? <laughs> 24. I said, hmm, I've been teaching since before you were born. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so all of that aside, let me pray. Father, I thank you for the work you've done in my life to shine the light on these truths that absolutely rescued me. I thank you that you push me every day to continue to embrace the work that Christ has already accomplished for us, for me. And so I want to pray for the women of study and share who just got a fire hose introduction to this subject that they would daily embrace the work Christ has already accomplished for us in the crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and Pentecost, and that each of us would eagerly await what is yet to be ours in his coming and revelation, even though we don't fully understand it all yet. And finally, Father, I want to thank you um, for proving the enemy wrong. What I shared last week is he was telling me that you were done with me in 19, whatever year that was, 90. And we, I know now that you were far from done with me and you're not done with me yet. So I thank you for the incredible privilege and honor that you've given me to lead women in their journey toward these events that are yet to come. And yet I echo the words of this song, yet not I but through Christ in me. Thank you, Father. You are so, so good. You have written a story none of us could even imagine, and you've given us everything we need for life and godliness through Christ. Amen. So as you listen to this song, 
I want you to pay attention to the countenance of Amanda. She's the lead vocalist. Watch her face as she sings these words. Good to be with you. Keep following. And I'll see you next week for the video where I'll introduce Liz to you. Bye. Why give to